find this very interesting. I've heard Dr. Borum speak a number of times in the past, and uh, not only is the gets the message across clear, he gets it across effectively. So I think you really well. That's <laughs> always sets the stage on that, right? What yeah. can I what can I say? <laughs> if I if I'm bad at the end, I go. What is Peter talking about? Anyways, like, like Peter said, we're, we'll go through this in form. Originally, we were going to do this without an audience, but it's a lot easier to talk to people, especially if they aren't falling asleep. But <laughs> so I'll try, and, I'll try and avoid that. So I was asked a, few, a while back, actually, from Peter to talk about some of this, uh, this radiation and, and cosmic radiation flying. And uh, he sent me this, uh, this, this brochure that was put out, presumably for Air Canada, for the Air Canada people, because there's lots of information on there about pilots and radiation exposures they get. So I, I went through it, I looked at it, and I, I thought I'd put it in the context of, let's talk about what radiation is, where it comes from, what you get exposed to naturally. Is this any different than what you would normally get exposed to? And what are some of the things we know about effects of radiation on pilots and on air crew? What are the effects of radiation on, on people at low doses that we're talking about? And I'll talk a little bit at the end if we have time about some of the science so we can learn that we're actually doing breaking edge, leading edge science and figuring out some of this stuff in terms of real effects. So I'm a professor here at McMaster University, and I also work at Bruce Power. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. So I'll just give you a bit of my history. I came from a uranium mining town called Elliott Lake, so northern Ontario. My dad was a uranium miner. I worked in the uranium mines in the summer while I was trying to put my way through college and university. I went to a school, Elliott Lake High School. You can't see it there, but that sign actually says ELSS, home of the Adams. So our sports teams were called the Adams. So everyone knew when we were coming to town, they could throw shots at us about radiation, glowing in the dark, stuff like that. One way to try and slow us down. We had good teams, though, so they couldn't say too much. I went off to, to college after high school and got my aircraft maintenance engineering uh, diploma and, and was going to get into the field of uh, being an AME. But that didn't pan out because in those days, nobody was hiring these people. So I went off to university. I was always interested in radiation, understanding radiation. So eventually finished my PhD at University of Ottawa. I worked at AECL, Atomic Energy of Canada, for uh, approximately 14 years, four years finishing my PhD and another 10 as their scientist, their radiation biology and health physics. Been at McMaster University for 12 years. Started at Bruce Power about four years ago when they started with the idea of building new reactors in Canada and they needed some educational outreach so I, I, I started working for them as, as their department manager for environment and eventually in, in integration. I put this up here because I have 26 years of research experience in the health effects of radiation. This is actually an image we took here at McMaster University. It's a shadow of a person. You see the person's head here, shoulders, the lungs, the spinal cord, and here's a dark area. This is a lung tumor in a person. This is done with a positron emission tomography scan so we can detect cancers growing inside of people. This picture of this lung tumor is actually my dad's lung tumor and automatically people say, well, he was a uranium miner lung tumor and there is lots of evidence that says in the old days when we were mining uranium and doing lots of nasty things like smoking cigarettes and drinking lots of alcohol and not having any ventilation in the mines there was an increased risk in some of the miners from getting lung cancer from this exposure largely because of the dust particles and things like that but I put this up because it's a good example of if we know what's going on in science we can actually work out where things happen this actually is a tumor called mesothelioma which is associated with asbestos and he worked in an asbestos mine for many years before he became a uranium miner. So you add all these things up and risk does definitely go up. <clears throat> so I went on the internet and looked up. So the first thing you put in, if you put pilots and radiation and ask for an image, this will come up and say, these guys were pilots in space and were exposed to space radiation. That's what you get. <laughs> right? So if you, get, if you just type in pilots and radiation, that will come up. So I, I would expect the people that see that would, would say, well, I probably don't want to end up like that, so this radiation must not be good for me. And again, you may want to be a superhero. I don't know. <clears throat> what I want to talk to you about today are a number of different things. I want to talk to you about sources of your radiation exposure. I like to talk to you about what galactic cosmic radiation is. Give you some uh, idea of what radiation units are. Radiation units are a terrible thing. There's all sorts of different units for all sorts of different things. We have different systems working in different countries and trying to figure it out, even at my stage of the game, I'll have to sit there sometimes with a napkin and write, write down numbers and go, what is that dose? I can't work it out. So I don't blame anyone who doesn't do this every day just to say this stuff is too confusing. So I'll try and talk to you a little bit about doses, a bit about the exposure there, can of pilots and crew get, talk about radiation from natural stuff, some health effects, and like I said, I'll show you some evidence at the end about some research we do. So radiation is everywhere. Radiation is as natural as air and water. It's, it's on our planet, it's everywhere. We use it for a number of things, everywhere from radials to microwaves, infrared, but this is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And depending upon the wavelength of the particle, the photons you have, or the, the, the photons you have, basically you get 
increasing shorter wavelength, higher energy, and at some point, the energy of your radiation has the ability to ionize molecules. That's why it's called ionizing radiation. So I, if I said, are you afraid of radiation? You might want to say, well, what, what type of radiation? I'm not really afraid of a microwave or invisible light or a telephone or radio waves, but I might be afraid of overexposure to ionizing radiation because we use it for a number of things. <clears throat> So, in the past, we would say that if you were exposed to radiation over your lifetime, approximately 80% of the radiation you get exposed to as a human would come from natural things. 80% natural. And about 20% would come from man-made things. Well, in the last sort of five to 10 years, we've worked out that, in fact, that's more like 50-50 now. And why would that be? Well, the reason for that is, is because we're getting more man-made radiation through medical procedures. So roughly 50% of your radiation, on average over a human's lifetime, will come from uh, man-made, and the other 50% will come from natural stuff. So in the beginning, of course, it all started with the Big Bang Theory. We had lots of radioactivity. We had a whole bunch of blobs flying around the universe, and all of a sudden solar systems were formed. Our solar system formed with a sun in the middle, again spewing off. So <clears throat> if we look at natural background radiation, it contributes about 50% of your lifetime exposure, like I said. And the two main sources are cosmic radiation and terrestrial radiation. I put sort of different proportions up here for you because when it comes down to it, cosmic radiation on the Earth's surface accounts for about 10% of your natural exposure to radiation. Whereas terrestrial stuff, 70% comes from a, a substance called radon, which I'll describe in a minute, and some internal emitters we have and some external emitters we have. <clears throat> so let's talk about cosmic radiation first. Unfortunately, that light is obscuring this a bit. But we can define cosmic radiation as two different types or sources of radiation. <clears throat> One coming from our sun, which is solar cosmic radiation, and radiation coming from all the other suns in the universe, so the stars. <clears throat> Streaming radioactive particles and photons in every direction possible and coming from outer space many billions of years ago. It's called cosmic, galactic cosmic radiation or GCR and SCR. We can just call it cosmic radiation because the origin of where it comes from generally won't impact the types of radiation we're going to get. So what about cosmic radiation? Well, cosmic radiation is extraterrestrial particles coming from outer space. In space, like when you're in space itself, so if you're actually out of the atmosphere, that cosmic radiation basically is uh, comprised of these types of particles. 50% of them are protons. And I'll talk to you about protons, alpha particles, and electrons a little later. But these are basically charged particles that are moving through space at almost the speed of light. And when they hit something, they interact with it. And they deposit their energy in it. In this particular picture here, you'll see that this is the northern lights. And when those particles actually are traveling through space and actually hit the Earth and start interacting with the molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, largely nitrogen and oxygen, they dissipate their energy off. And you can see that in the form of wavelengths of light. And other scattered particles are produced. So in space, they're made of this, but when we start getting interactions and losing energy in the atmosphere, we see that we get other secondary particles produced like neutrons. And depending on where you are in the atmosphere, what altitude you're at, you can have different ratios of these things. There's a map of cosmic ray exposure in North America. <coughs> and I'm not even going to talk to you about this yet, but this is the dose get rate you get per hour. And what's the first thing that strikes, jumps out at you? Where's the highest dose rates? Well, the purple colors. And the purple colors are the highest elevations. So just by changing your elevation on this planet, you're getting different rates of cosmic radiation on the surface. So you can imagine when you change your altitude in terms of your career or your occupation, you're going to get different levels of radiation exposure. All right, so galactic cosmic radiation. This is a picture of the sun, a cartoon, solar flare coming off. And as you know, solar flares or coronal mass ejections will actually produce ionizing radiation that spews out from the sun. We had one a couple of weeks ago that was basically fairly large. They were talking about knocking out telecommunications and things. These things spew towards the Earth. This is supposed to be the Earth here, a little circle. And the blue lines represent the magnetic field around the Earth. So our first sort of shield against cosmic radiation and galactic radiation is the magnetic field. And you can probably see that there's kind of a almost like a force field where the, ra the, the cosmic radiation is being shielded here and you get some kind of bands forming where the cosmic radiation is being sort of filtered or funneled by the magnetic field. And that's protecting us largely from many of the things, especially the solar flares, this magnetic field around the Earth. 
Consequently, you can see that when it comes around, it's coming to the South Pole and the North Pole, that's where we're picking up the Northern Lights because it's deflecting it to the South and North Pole. So you can see it at night interacting with the atmospheric molecules. Well, cosmic radiation health, air crew and frequent flyers. Like I said, we get shielding from our atmosphere is, re is reduced if you're up higher in the atmosphere. If you're down on the Earth's surface, it's one thing. But as you get higher, 30,000 feet, you don't have that 30,000 feet of atmosphere to shield you from the stuff that gets by the magnetic fields. Magnetic field deflects most of the low energy cosmic rays. The upper atmosphere is mostly nitrogen and oxygen. And on the surface, you get about a 100-fold decrease in cosmic radiation levels compared to if you didn't have atmosphere in general uh, from space. And of course, if you're working at high altitudes, there's less protection than on the ground from this amount of radiation and this form of radiation. Now, <clears throat> this is the part where people will fall asleep, and I, you can go ahead and take a quick mini nap if you want, because, but I still have to tell you this stuff. And it's very frustrating for me to actually go through this, but nonetheless, when we talk about dose, we have to talk about absorbed dose. This is energy that's going to be absorbed into your tissues. And you can measure dose in terms of energy. And energy can be measured in units called joules per kilogram. So dose, the unit for that, the SI unit, the international standard, is gray. Some people use the word rad. A lot of people use rads, but we're going to stick with the SI units here. I want to say it's gray, and spelled gray that way. And the, the symbol for it is GY, and it's a joule per kilogram energy absorbed per unit mass. So that's just energy. But now we're talking about all these different types of radiation, different charged particles, different types of, uh, of masses of things that are interacting with things. And when they interact with us, or living things, they have sort of a different uh, effect on us in terms of how much energy they put into our tissues. And based on, the, um, based on the effect that they have, we can assign numbers to them. So we call that a radiation weighting factor, and it's based on the radiation quality. So electrons and photons, so gamma rays and x-rays, we just say that's one. Protons have a little higher um, uh, number, and alpha particles have about 10 times higher number. And that just means that there's 10 times the biological effect when the same dose of radiation hits you. Okay. Well, if you're still with me on that, <laughs> we'll move down to equivalent dose. And that's just another unit we can use um, to basically say that now what we're going to do is take all this, this stuff, take for energy and weighting factors of the radiation quality, and turn it into what we call an equivalent dose. And that unit is a sievert. Sieverts and grays. That's all I'm going to go with today. Because we talk about sieverts in this, and all your numbers are given in sieverts, microsieverts and nanosieverts, but nonetheless sieverts. A gray and a sievert are exactly the same thing if we're talking about protons and electrons because it's one. There's no difference between the two. When you do calculations like this, if you had a dose of 0.15 gray of gamma rays, which is one, and 0 0.02 grays of neutrons, which carry uh, 20, you just do the calculation, now you come up with a dose. It's, it's called an equivalent <coughs> dose because it's not really dose. That's the toughest part for most people to understand. It's an equivalent dose. We're going to say <coughs> that allows us to normalize all this stuff and say, all right, it's all sorts of different particles. Space radiation has all these different things, but we're going to normalize it into one sort of unit called the sievert. And we'll use that to talk to you about what we think the dose has in terms of a risk weighting factor to it. All right, so we got our unit. We're going to talk about sieverts for the rest of this lecture <coughs> or this seminar. And it's SV. One sievert is 1,000 millisieverts. Millisievert? One thousandth of a sievert is a millisievert, and one millisievert is a thousand microsieverts. So I'll be talking about sieverts, microsieverts, and millisieverts as we go through this. It's the unit we're going to use, and just so you don't get confused, you have this slide. In fact, we have this presentation, and we can make some hard copies of it. I should have made some before we came, but <coughs> I didn't. So this is not a picture of Air Canada crew. Unfortunately, I looked on Air Canada crew on the internet, and there's all sorts of pictures there, but I can't get a picture of the crew with, it, with an Air, Air Canada jet behind it. So I got this air crew. What does this air crew get exposed to occupationally from galactic cosmic radiation? Uh, it's about one to two times natural background radiation, which works out to two to four millisieverts. Okay? So natural background radiation, I'll talk to you about getting about one to two times above what you're naturally going to get anyways by flying on average in general, being air crew on, on this type of uh, occupational um, occupation you have.